Please select a mission. Mission accepted. The treaty was drawn up to limit not just the size of the U.S. and Soviet Union's nuclear arsenals, but also their delivery systems. The whole deal. That's when we thought all those years of negotiations had paid off. Somebody decides to invade Afghanistan. The timing couldn't have been worse. The president was in the middle of the SALT II talks back then. Oh, you mean while you were busy trying to stop Peace Walker? I heard. President Ford was meeting with the general secretary in Vladivostok. In his absence, the political brass in America detected what they didn't realize was false nuclear launch data from Peace Walker. They were on the verge of ordering a retaliatory nuclear Analysis strike. Complete. Coleman's big idea? Humans are incapable of destroying themselves. Turns out he never knew what humans are capable of. If that AI, I mean, Analysis the boss, complete. hadn't found a way to stop the fake data transmission, they probably would have gone ahead with the launch. The turns was revealed as the pipe dream it was. All thanks to you, and her. The U.S.-Soviet talks looked set to fall through. What happened in Nicaragua no doubt helped trigger a change of heart. But in the end, the times define the politics. When you've grabbed their tail, they turn and bite your hand. I first met you 20 years ago now. The place was Selenuyarsk in the Soviet Union. We were enemies. I was with the crew. You were still fighting for America. 1964. Operation Snake Eater. Its objective? The assassination of the legendary soldier known as the Boss. When you returned home successful, they awarded you the title Big Boss. Your CO, Zero, sought to carry on the Boss's will by covertly establishing his own organization. You knew the original members from Operation Snake Eater. From America, there was David O, or as he was to you, Major Zero. Donald Anderson, a.k.a. Sigand. Dr. Clark, who went by a paramedic during the operation. And the fourth, you. From China, there was Eva. And me, Ocelot, from the Soviet Union. Six in total. To us, government notions of friend and foe were meaningless. As were East and West, we joined forces by our will alone. Our objective was to fulfill the boss's dying wish, to make the world one. And to do it, Zero used the philosopher's legacy, 
the secret war fund you obtained during Operation Snake Eater. This organization would go on to become Cypher. I, on the other hand, was left with a problem. You only recovered half of the legacy. I had to locate the other half. Black Carrot. It's something of an ancestor to the domestic carrot. It's also a favorite of wild animals. We still trust with him in those days. We thought what he was doing was the boss's will. Until he started that one project. Les enfants terribles. Zero called it. You parted ways. As did Eva, leaving only Anderson and Clark still with him. I maintain limited contact. Although truth be told. Please select a mission. Mission accepted. treaty was drawn up to limit not just the size of the U.S. and Soviet Union's nuclear arsenals, but also their delivery systems. The whole deal. That's when we thought all those years of negotiations had paid off. Somebody decides to invade Afghanistan. The timing couldn't have been worse. The president was in the middle of the SALT II talks back then. You mean while you were busy trying to stop Peace Walker? I heard. President Ford was meeting with the general secretary in Vladivostok. In his absence, the political brass in America detected what they didn't realize was false nuclear launch data from Peace Walker. They were on the verge of ordering a retaliatory nuclear strike. Coleman's big idea? Humans are incapable of destroying themselves. Turns out he never knew what humans are capable of. If that AI, I mean, Analysis the boss, complete. hadn't found a way to stop the fake data transmission, they probably would have gone ahead with the launch. Deterrence was revealed as the pipe dream it was. All thanks to you, and her. The U.S.-Soviet talks looked set to fall through. What happened in Nicaragua no doubt helped trigger a change of heart. But in the end, the times define the politics. When you've grabbed their tail, they turn and bite your hand. I first met you 20 years ago now. The place was Selenuyarsk in the Soviet Union. We were enemies. I was with the crew. You were still fighting for America. 1964. Operation Snake Eater. Its objective? The assassination of the legendary soldier known as the Boss. When you returned home successful, they awarded you the title Big Boss. Your CO, Zero, sought to carry on the Boss's will by covertly establishing his own organization. You knew the original members from Operation Snake Eater. 
From America, there was David O, or as he was to you, Major Zero. Donald Anderson, a.k.a. Sigand. Dr. Clark, who went by a paramedic during the operation. And the fourth, you. From China, there was Eva. And me, Ocelot, from the Soviet Union. Six in total. To us, government notions of friend and foe were meaningless. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. The Soviet Union rolled into Afghanistan. Muslims had revolted against the Soviet-friendly regime established the year before. The DRA forces could no longer contain it themselves, so the Soviets went in to intervene. The Afghan government was powerless and fraught with infighting. They lost the hearts and minds of the people, and that alarmed the Soviet leadership. With the Islamic Revolution happening in Iran, the Soviets felt they had to act fast or risk the spread of Islamic revivalism. A superpower sending a motorized rifle division against men on horseback with antique rifles. Everyone thought it'd be over in an instant. Only it wasn't. Some Muslims made their fight a jihad, a holy war, and began a guerrilla campaign on all fronts. A war of attrition. These fighters call themselves Mujahideen. They're being supported by the West through Pakistan. That's why Miller was involved. He was training them near the Zero Line, sponsored by the CIA. The war has become a nightmare for the Soviet troops stationed here. They thought they'd be headed home in six months at the most. Then a year passed. Two years. Now here we are four years on with no exit in sight. Afghanistan has become the Soviet Union's Vietnam. The Soviet troops on the ground want to go home, but at least they have homes to go back to. The Afghans have lost theirs. The Soviets destroy the Kishloks, villages, wherever they can. They burn down homes and fields, fill in wells, turn pastures into minefields. It's created a mass of refugees who fled to Pakistan. If the Mujahideen are fish swimming around the villages, the Soviets will go so far as to dry out their ocean. But this has had a big price. There's bitter resentment among the Afghans, and they're taking out their anger on the soldiers on the front lines. Among the Mujahideen are the Pashtun people. They're fiercely devoted to their code of Badal, or revenge. Please? Soviets they've captured have had their hands, feet, and noses cut off before being left to die at the side of the road, just to show their comrades what they're capable of. Friendlies who come across them can do nothing but put them out of their misery. Then they burn down another village in retaliation, and the cycle of vengeance goes on. Please select a drop point. Supplies requested.
Supply drop complete. Spit it out. Spit it out. The map has been updated. arrived at Mother Base. This war... The Kremlin never expected to have this much trouble against the Mujahideen. Afghanistan is a tribal society. Tradition demands that its people stand up to any outsiders who set foot on their land. With the honor of their people at stake, they have everything to fight for. No matter how hard the Soviets hit them, they continue to appear out of nowhere, striking back, then vanishing again. But there's one thing even the Mujahideen fear. Every last one of them. The Soviet gunships. They're highly maneuverable and equipped with massive firepower. Plus, the underside of the fuselage is heavily armored. The Mujahideen can barely scratch them with their small arms. Anyone who hangs around gets mowed down by the gunship's heavy machine guns. This new honeybee weapon that was given to the Hamid fighters, it's no doubt something to help them strike back against the gunships. Which makes it a weapon that could change the course of the war. Those guerrilla fighters known as Mujahideen don't actually belong to a single organization. Afghanistan is a multi-ethnic country. You've got the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and each of them is split into their own tribes, large and small. Each ethnicity has several rebel organizations that their various tribes gather under. They're united under the banner of Jihad, but that doesn't mean they work like a single standing army. Just look at the area around Smasi Fort. A lot of Tajiks used to live there, but they fled after the Soviets started their scorched earth campaign. With the area uninhabited, the Hamid fighters, who are Pashtun, decided to move in. The Hamid That's an enemy gunship. A single burst from his machine gun can cut a man in half. Tread carefully, boss. People have long lived in Afghanistan and western Pakistan. They used to travel back and forth frequently. Then Britain went and established the border that still stands today. The Hamid fighters get generous support from the Pakistani government. The government wants to use them to secure influence over Afghanistan. Their liaison with the Hamids is inner services intelligence. And behind the ISI, you have the CIA. Boss, get down. That's, probably how That's an enemy gunship. Stay low and crawl along the ground. That should enable you to sneak past enemies. before I was captured by the Soviets. We were on the Zero Line that day, the Afghan side, on our way back from training the Mujahideen at a mountain camp in Kuna province. There's a lot of that work in Afghanistan. Most PFs shy away from it because it draws too much attention. But for us, that was the whole point. The job itself went great. We just had to make it back to a tribal area in Pakistan. 
But all of a sudden, visibility got real bad. It was no sense. Our point man gave the strange report. He said he could see skulls in the mist. Skulls? The next moment, he went silent. We scrambled into formation, right before his arms and legs came raining down on us. Analysis complete. It was always supposed to be a dangerous mission, so I had Diamond Dogs very best with me. We were calling out to each other. But one by one, the voices just went dead. Whatever happened to me, I lost consciousness before I knew it. When I came to, I was in a Soviet camp, tied to an interrogation chair. Could they be some new Spetsnaz unit? No. The ones that interrogated me were just the average rank and file. Whatever group attacked us, the way they moved was just insane. And that mist, appearing out of nowhere. The Soviets don't have tech like that. If they did, Ocelot would have heard about it. I doubt the West does either. Otherwise, the folks at Langley would be sleeping a lot easier. Why'd they come after you? Wish I knew. I'm the only one who survived. Though I don't think they planned it that way. If I was their target, they wouldn't have just handed me over to the 40th Army. Whatever the case, we need to watch our step until we know who they really are. And boss, if you ever do run into them again, don't try to take them on. You just get the hell out of there. When I first started dealing with Zero, with Cypher, it was a somewhat parasitic relationship. Though, a mutually beneficial one. Cypher had no army of their own, so they wanted you to extract him. They wanted to extract him. They approached me as a potential... So a sandstorm's come in. Sandstorms effectively make you blind and deaf. But that goes for the enemy, too. Use the situation to your advantage. They forced us to join them. That was the plan. That's why they had Paz, still Zeke. Right. And if we refused, she would use Zeke to fire a nuke from Mother Base. The world would consider us a liability countries would unite to destroy us. We stopped the launch. And yet they still took us down. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Their sabotage. That power Cypher wanted. We don't have it anymore. So why are they still after you? Is it just the fear of leaving you alive? I don't know. Was Zero really... All I know is the man I knew wouldn't want this. What do you mean? We have to consider that it might not be Zero we're dealing with. We know virtually nothing about Cypher anymore. How big they've gotten, what they want, or even who they really are. The new mother base started out as a test drilling rig operated by a mineral resources supplier, but their project fell through. The Seychelles government was happy to hand the place over to us. It was just scrap on stilts. Hmm. So with a few dummy construction companies set up as fronts, we started renovating the half-finished rig. From the outside, it looked like the project was back on rails. Cause, you... What? I see what you're doing. Recreating the mother base we had nine years ago. Only this time. That's right. The mother base Cypher thought they destroyed will return from the grave to kill them. We'll prove to the world that we were the victors. And if we lose again? They can't fool us the same way twice. Now our enemies are in plain sight. And when our organization gets too big, we split it across companies. Any company that draws attention gets liquidated, and its capital is back-channeled into a new company. Most PFs are small-time operations anyway. And in this business, the minnows go bankrupt all the time. We've never aroused suspicion. Plus, we have Hewick. Hewick? Human Exploitation Company. It's a business specializing in intel gathering. Think of it as a civilian intelligence agency. At Smasse Ford. To Smasse Le Mans. Now to find the honeybee. That gave me the idea. We dispatch moles into conflict zones around the world, and each sets up an intel network on site. Then they stay in place to give us stable points of contact when other nations intervene in the conflict. Hewick's strength is that it has a cutout at each level. You get your job from one guy, then you hand it off to another. No one has direct access. It's a perfect black box. Hewick members also work their way into the superpowers intelligence agencies to make sure Di <laughs> gets work. We have those countries by the balls. That's our deterrent when we need it. Networking in the intelligence community. 
Sure, that's how we've grown this far. And when you go out on missions, intel from Hewick will be there to back you up. But despite all that, Cypher has its eyes on us. The only reason I'm not dead is that they needed to know where you were. Figured if you woke up, I'd go straight to you. That's why you made that ruckus at the Zero Line. Yeah, to make their own surveillance work against them. Some of the heat off Cyprus. Guys. Yeah. to save me. And I've gotten used to waiting. Guys. That's not all. It was a good chance to scout the market. And with the West wanting the Soviets out of Afghanistan, their agencies are bursting into seams with funding. The Soviets must be making the prisoner take them to the honeybee. Presence. If you follow them, they could lead you right to it. Another base in the Seychelles. We're at the center of the world here. We're all the way out in the Indian Ocean. Extraction Come on. Around. Lebanon, Sri Lanka, East Timor, and Africa. From here, our reach extends to conflict zones the world over, including Afghanistan, of course. So it's prime real estate for a mercenary. Exactly. Latin America isn't as close as I'd like, but we have Amanda and her people to help in that department. And besides, the Seychelles government owes us a favor. Owes us? The Seychelles has strong ties to the East, which the West wanted to shake up. It came to a head three years ago, in an attempted coup. It was a force of South African mercenaries, with U.S. backing behind the scenes. They were only platoon size. But South Africa is home to some heavy PFs. Too much for the Seychelles to handle. In the end, they accepted help from the Tanzanian army and quelled the coup. We set up the deal and handled on-site tactical instruction. That led to some training work for the Seychelles military. And when we put down a mutiny within their forces, well, we made a lot of people happy. They don't pay us. They just let us have a piece of their offshore territory on the promise we'll come running if something else happens. So we're bodyguards, too. It's a good setup. We can only take Mother Base so far here. We'll have to find somewhere else when this place starts getting big. Aren't you being a little hasty? Nothing hasty about it. You're back with us now. So, Kaz, the ship that took us from Cyprus, it used to be a whaler. Yeah, a Japanese vessel. Complete. How was the voyage? It was... stimulating. <laughs> well, she was part of a whaling fleet up until a few years ago. Her displacement isn't anything to write home about, but she can really move. She still had plenty of life left in her, but then the work dried up. Global opposition to whaling has been mounting for years. Is that right? The push to ban it has been gaining traction for a little over a decade. Individual species came under protection as the years went on. And then two years ago, the IWC adopted a moratorium on commercial whaling. Several countries, including Japan, fought into the bitter end. But eventually, most whaling companies had no choice. There may be evidence as to where they've hidden the target. Got a pair of night vision goggles on you? When I was a kid in Japan, practically everybody ate it. That good, huh? The country was poor in those days, and whale was cheap. International opinions changed since then. In any case, that's why we were able to get a bargain price on the ship. Of course, we did end up spending five times the purchase price in modifications. We had to really work to fit in all the ESM and communications gear while keeping the whaler look intact. Right now, she's going around conducting SIGIN missions. In the future, we plan to use her as a communications relay base between you and Mother Base, and also as a chopper resupply vessel. Diamond docks. The word diamond originally comes from the Greek Adamas. It means indomitable, unyielding. Other words for the stones often mean eternal bond, fortitude, or purity. The same is true of the Star of Bethlehem flowers you laid on the boss's grave. They represent innocence, as well as chastity, yielding to no man while maintaining one's virtue. In other words, staying loyal to something. 